Hello, my name is Sandy Fivecoat and I'll be your host. In this video, we'll be discussing the new wave of writing assessments and how this will affect students' overall test scoring. And joining me today in this discussion is Scott Miller, who is an author and also a senior instructional specialist with Zaner Blozer. Thank you so much for joining us today, Scott. We're so happy to have you. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. You know, assessment is always on the minds of teachers these days, and it drives an awful lot of what occurs in the classroom. We know assessing writing is a special challenge sometimes for teachers, so I'd love to hear from you as an expert in this area. How are the next generation writing tests functionally different and more rigorous than previous tests? And how do these differences really inform classroom instruction? Well, there are a lot of answers to that question. Uh, first is the simple fact that the new tests are going to be computer-based. So this begs a lot of questions about how to prepare students for an instrument that's completely different in its format. Uh, another reason that the new tests are going to be different is because they incorporate the use of stimuli texts. So in a nutshell, students are required to read and respond not just to a single source, but sometimes multiple sources. And so the way that that works is that, say, for example, on a performance task or a research simulation task, students might read something, and then they would respond to a set of selected response questions, um, technology-enhanced selected response questions, and maybe even some constructed responses to each of two or three different sources. And then after doing that, uh, they would roll up their understanding of those three sources, and they would synthesize a written response in a specific text type. Uh, so that would be one example of how these tests are going to be more complex than writing tests that we've given in the past. One more thing that sort of informs teachers is to know that even math questions are going to require written responses. So for example, a student might have to answer a math question and get an answer, but then they would have to explain how they got to that answer. And in other cases, they might be presented with multiple answers that could be correct, and they might have to argue for the answer that they believe to be correct and explain their thinking. So practically, I think what that means for teachers is, number one, we've got to reintegrate these reading and writing reciprocal skills that, uh, for one reason or another, we seem to have artificially divorced for some time. So instructionally, it's highly recommended for teachers to have students read things and respond to them directly in writing, and specifically using questions that require the student to get back into the text and use textual evidence and cite that textual evidence as they respond. Uh, one more thing I think is highly indicated is the instruction of writing in the content areas, which means in math class, in science, in social studies have students practice articulating their thinking and writing, number one, it helps the students to practice negotiating the kinds of questions that they're going to face on PARC and Smarter Balanced. And number two, uh, by writing about what they know, students really have to understand it. So what content area teachers are going to realize is that as students practice articulating their thinking and writing, they actually master the content better. Wow, those are very, very good insights and a great preparation for all teachers anticipating these new assessments. But let's talk a little bit about scoring. How will these be changed? In other words, how will students' writing be scored with this next generation assessment? I think there's still a lot of questions uh, yet to be answered about that. But both of the consortia have gone on record saying that they're going to use a combination of electronic and human scoring. Now, exactly what that means... I'm not entirely sure, but I do know that both consortia offer evolving draft rubrics for examination on their respective websites, and I do see those rubrics being refined and, and somewhat simplified over time. But as we look at the rubrics, um, one thing that's important to understand is they take the whole of writing instruction, which resides within the six known traits of writing and how those traits are manipulated within the writing process, and they sort of boil it down. And so where you have six fundamental traits or assessables of writing, those six traits are somewhat um, squeezed into a smaller number of categorical indicators. So, for example, you have an indicator that says uh, on the park draft rubrics, written expression, and it tends to cover multiple traits like ideas, organization, word choice, and voice. So I guess the big indication for classroom teachers is that as you look at the draft rubrics, 
understand that this is how student writing is likely to be scored. Some part of it can be done by a machine, but a good portion of it is going to have to be done by a human being. And understand that these instruments probably don't have tremendous formative value because they condense all of the variables of writing so tightly into so few categories. Very interesting. Now, can you cover what those six categories of writing are? Certainly. Uh, when we refer to the six traits of writing, we're referring to the six fundamental things that we can observe, comment upon, revise for, and edit for within the writing process. So the six traits sort of represent the DNA of writing, if you will. Ideas would be content, basically your thinking as it lands on the paper. Organization is the structure that you use to build your writing, uh, which would include how you begin, how you end, how you use transitions to knit things together in the middle, um, how you put your paragraphs together and in what order. Then we've got voice. And voice is really the personality, the attitude, the enthusiasm of the writer showing through in the writing. Voice tends to be that thing that grabs the reader and pulls them in. So we've got ideas, organization, voice, word choice focuses heavily on nouns and verbs. The big idea being if you select precise and clear nouns and verbs, that the modifiers you choose can be fewer in number, and the modifiers that you choose should be appropriately chosen. But the big idea is that you pick the right nouns and verbs to carry your message so that you don't have to be quite so reliant on the modifiers. Sentence fluency is sort of the way that your writing sounds when it's read aloud. It's the flow of a piece. So good writing tends to have a rhythm and flow, and it tends to be very pleasing when it's read aloud. It sounds good to the ear. And finally, we have conventions. And conventions is all about the correctness and the appearance of the writing. So are all the grammar, usage, and mechanics items tightened down? And when you look at the piece, when it's published, does it appeal? Is the font size correct? Is the handwriting neat? Are the margins respected? So that's part of conventions as well. Great. That's really helpful. Thank you. Now, let's talk a little bit about the impact of student writing on overall performance. What's the importance of writing instruction across the content areas? Well, we've already touched on this a little bit. We see on the prototype items that are being offered by the consortia that a written explanation is going to be required on a lot of the math items. So to highlight the importance of writing in the content areas, I'll tell you that some of the prototypes I've analyzed uh, have as much as 29 to 40 percent of the total available point value for the item assigned to the written part, which means a huge number of points on the math test are going to have to be earned through explanatory or argument writing. It's a lot easier to answer fill-in-the-blank items or multiple choice items than it is to write about a topic from scratch because to write about something requires students to have um, a greater understanding of it. Uh, and it, as a student writes about something, the process of writing sort of helps them to understand what they know, what they don't know, and it helps them to fill in the gaps in their own understanding as a learning process. Terrific. Thanks so much. To conclude, Scott, do you have any simple hints for teachers to prepare for this new generation of writing assessments? Certainly. I think one very strong thing to do is to make sure to reintegrate uh, the reading instruction with the writing instruction and treat those reciprocal skill sets um, side by side. So have students read something, have them respond to it in writing, and don't just have them respond to it in writing using one text type. Have students respond to something that they've read uh, narratively, tell a story that relates to what they've read and then turn around and maybe using the same source, the same stimuli text, have them respond uh, informatively or explanatorily by comparing, contrasting, explaining causes and effects, etc. And then maybe even a third time, go back to the same stimuli text, the same source, and have students respond with an opinion or an argument uh, that relates to what they've read. This gets students flexibly using the three different common core text types in response to a passage, which is a great way to get them ready for what we're going to see on Parker Smarter Balanced. So there's one very clear thing that teachers can do to make a big difference, I think, in test scores. Another thing that teachers may want to consider is having students repeatedly write to multiple sources on the same topic. So have them read two or three stimuli texts, 
that all relate to a specific topic that they're covering in a content area. And then have students practice analyzing each one of those sources, pulling out textual evidence to use in their own synthesized written response that covers multiple sources. I think those are true, really great practices to use in the writing classroom to get kids ready for what they're going to see on the next generation assessments. Excellent suggestions, Scott. Thank you so much. Sadly, that's all the time we have today. I think we could talk to you for a long time about this incredibly interesting and relevant topic for teachers. So thanks for all this information. Now, to our listening audience, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at whatcasts at weareteachers.com with any thoughts, feedback, or topics that you'd like to see us cover in the future. Thanks again for joining us, and have a great day. Mm-hmm.